Uh, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome the moderator for today, uh, Ms. Vedika Bandarkar, who is the Chief Global Impact Officer of Water.org. Vedika, over to you to kick off. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the ongoing uh, COVID pandemic has almost lifted the hood on a wide range of structural issues in India's development landscape. I think none of us will forget or should forget uh, the visual of the sea of migrants uh, heading back to their villages uh, in the scorching sun or in the dead of the night. And, and this has really put a spotlight on how unequal India's development has been and, and the disproportionate reliance that we have uh, and we have continued to have on our large cities uh, to generate both employment and economic opportunities. Uh, my name is Vedika Bhandarkar. Uh, I'm the Chief of Global Impact for Water.org. And I'm joined here by Ravi Venkatesan, the founder of Global Alliance for Mass Entrepreneurship, or GAME, and Anant Maheshwari, the president of Microsoft India, uh, to discuss the role of market-based solutions in spreading prosperity beyond the tier one cities for a more inclusive growth in a post-COVID world. So let me start with you, uh, Ravi. Uh, first of all, thank you both for being here. Uh, and, and let me just jump into the conversation and start with you. Uh, so Game, I know recently published a report on uh, improving economic dynamism and accelerating uh, MSME or the micro, small, medium enterprises growth. And I'm gonna quote uh, some statistics liberally from your report. So the MSMEs have been the backbone of the Indian economy. Uh, the sector as a whole employs um, 11 crore people, which is almost 40% uh, of the non-farm workforce of India. Uh, it plays a very critical role in the supply chains of several large companies. Uh, it contributes to close to 25% of the services GDP, uh, almost 33% of the manufacturing output, but despite this critical role, and I think you could, uh, call it out in the report, you say that MSMEs are at the risk of mass extinction. And I think you refer to this vicious cycle of uh, informality, uh, low productivity and uh, stuntedness. Uh, and also point out that during this COVID, uh, the lockdown and the economic crisis, thousands of MSMEs will cease to exist. So Ravi, in your opinion, what can and what is being done and what should be done uh, for reviving India's MSME sector? Yeah, thank you, Vedika. It's, of course, fantastic to be here um, with two old friends, you and uh, Anand. Um, and so thanks for that setup. Um, so you're right. Look, even pre-COVID, the sector was really struggling, right? So we have about 63 million, 6.3 crore um, MSMEs. But I, I'm still, you know, despite wallowing in the data for quite some time, quite stunned by the fact that 90% of them are informal, 95% employ less than five people. And overall in the country, we have only, you know, 20,000 firms with a share capital or equity capital of more than 10 crores. So if you think about this, you've got this giant economy, nearly 3 trillion, standing on a pinhead, a really, really, really small uh, enterprise base. And, um, you know, the, the MSMEs struggled through the demonetization um, period, then there was GST. And so COVID is really the third shock to hit them. And um, yeah, so we very much see this as a very high likelihood of mass extinction. Already the surveys, including our own, indicate two thirds of them have run out of cash, dipping into personal savings. And who knows how long this pandemic will last before the economy is able to really um, you know, resume as it used to be. And so um, our best estimate is 10% have probably shut shop already for, for good. And so that estimate of a third or 40% is not wild, widely off. So the question is, what can be done, right? So the issue is, um, the, the central issue here is that the ease of, lack of ease of doing business, okay? Notwithstanding India's progress on the World Bank rating, that large part of it is true from the lens of large firms. But for MSMEs, it is still horrifically hard to start up a business and run it. 
and the cost of compliance is very high. So most of them choose, therefore, to remain informal. The problem with informality then is you can't access credit or capital at affordable rates. Therefore, you can't make investments in automation, machinery, uh, technology, workforce skilling. So you remain unproductive. And so you get stuck in this vicious spiral. So when we looked, we created, uh, constituted this task force you referred to under Dr. K.P. Krishnan, former Secretary of Government of India. And the, we said, look, uh, how, what is it that can be done? And so this report lays out essentially three phases of interventions. One is in the short term, which we call survive. Then there's a medium term, which is about a year or 18 months, which is revive. And then a set of things we do to create a more flourishing uh, long-term sector. In the uh, short term, uh, the primary focus is on liquidity. Now, of course, the government has announced a stimulus package and a whole bunch of things for MSMEs, but the, we have two major problems. First, communication. Uh, turns out there's still a large challenge in terms of making sure MSMEs understand it and the bankers understand it. Number two, um, the beneficiaries of these pro uh, programs are largely people who are already availing of loans from banks and whose accounts were standard or they were not defaulters. So if you were outside the uh, financial system when COVID hit, well, uh, and that's about close to 90% of them, uh, this really doesn't benefit you. So a lot of our recommendations are around, hey, how do we make sure 30% of this money is reserved for uh, firms that are outside the ambit? Number two, Look, it turns out that both government and large companies are egregious exploiters and delaying payments to MSMEs. So can we put some real teeth be and compliance behind paying them rough, reasonably on time? How do you introduce things like you know, supply chain uh, financing and so forth? And we're working with two or three states already, Vedika, on implementing it. The medium term is massively on um, simplifying the ease of doing businesses. We've identified seven processes, including you know, establishing a business, health safety uh, compliances, labor laws, et cetera. So how do you simplify them, digitize them and decriminalize them? It turns out it, even a modest factory has about 750 compliances, 120 filings per annum, most of mm -hmm. which really don't make sense. And 9,000 of these uh, laws have criminal consequences. So can we decriminalize it? That's kind of the me medium term. And the long term really is about how do you massively catalyze entrepreneurship, new business formation, that two businesses that start out formal, able to access credit and able to be therefore productive, grow, create jobs and so forth. So as I said before, a lot of the action is in the states and that's where we are busy with, uh, particularly starting with Punjab where we are getting on the ground, but then Uttarakhand, Karnataka as well. And of course we're working with the MSME and other central government ministries. Thank you, Ravi. A uh, lot of uh, food for thought and uh, especially uh, it, it, the points which you made about 90% of the MSMEs being out of the guarantee scheme, uh, which I think is a great scheme, but uh, how do you bring uh, the MSMEs yeah. who are not existing borrowers. And also the point about disincentives for large companies to make the payments on time. I thought those were uh, really, really interesting. Uh, but talking about new business formation, and, and may I uh, now turn to you, Anand. So I know Microsoft's been betting really big on digital transformation uh, as the driver for jobs. Uh, and, and also you're investing in the digital ecosystem that prepares the workforce uh, for jobs of the future. So how do you think Microsoft and others can take this now for, further forward to every section of the society? Thank you, Vedika. And once again, I, I would echo the joy of being here with uh, Ravi and you uh, and, and, and having this conversation. So uh, as you said, uh, when you opened the, the conversation, lives have changed dramatically uh, in the last few months. Uh, our formats of working, learning, and even having this conversation have changed very, very significantly. Uh, yeah. Today, you would think of a teacher, whether in a large town or a small town, suddenly beginning to learn new skills of how to manage a virtual classroom. Now, we, we feel good that the virtual classroom is happening, but we forget that the teacher was never trained uh, to have a virtual classroom. 
Similarly, we are expecting a doctor and a nurse to provide comfort and care and, and, and medical support virtually. Uh, again, they were never trained uh, to, to have uh, that kind uh, of, of, of a job description uh, and, and, and the skill set. A small business owner, to Ravi's point, is just very rapidly learning the tools uh, to, to use the digital tools, to get their offerings out to people, to interact, to create connections. And all of this is happening as we speak. Uh, there is therefore a, a change happening in front of our eyes. The transformation of India will depend very significantly on how quickly we get this foundation of digital you know, for, for everybody in, in the country. And COVID-19 has accelerated this tech adoption just big time uh, in the last uh, few, few months. Uh, as we look at this uh, tech-enabled future and, and as we imagine how India will, will think about this uh, and, and for this to be inclusive, for this to really be available and, and you know, present in every part of the country, uh, from small and micro businesses, migrant workers, farmers, nonprofits, and all vulnerable communities. I think it's increasingly important that organizations now pivot themselves to think about a purpose driven digital. Uh, because uh, even uh, companies like ours and, and, uh, and many so in India, because India is a powerhouse of, of technology globally, there is that need for driving purpose to leverage tech. And as I see, there are three elements to purpose-driven digital, which are critical to, to make happen if you're going to drive any kind of transformation. And those three elements are, number one is access, second is inclusion, and third is killing. So do I have access to this? Am I included in this? And then do I have the skills uh, to use this? And let me just take a few minutes to walk through each of these uh, three. Access, we all understand, it's not just about the device being available to, to all sections of the society, even bandwidth being available to uh, every part of the uh, country and continuous bandwidth. And even if you have the device and the bandwidth, the cost of, uh, of just being uh, online and, and accessing it, there's so much around infrastructure uh, that needs mm -hmm. to be pulled together. And this can't change overnight. Let's recognize that a lot needs to get done. Um, in this space, government, civil society, com companies have to come together to solve the issue of access. Mm -hmm. The second one is if I have access, am I included? Now, yeah. many people would say, hey, listen, I also have to do work at home today, not just work from home. Uh, and therefore, mm -hmm. uh, I can only uh, get stuff done and I can, I can participate in a learning or, or working Maybe at 9 p.m. I can't do this at 10 a.m. because I have yeah. to do something else uh, at, uh, at 10 a.m. It could be a question of time. It could be a question of just sharing something at home. Same thing. So there are two devices at home. People are using it. So or one device at home and therefore they need to sequence it. Inclusion is all of, also about language, about platforms, uh, about yeah. the way we are interacting with people. So there's a lot around inclusion uh, that has to be thought through when you think about the digital ecosystem. And once you feel you have access, you have included, do I have the skills uh, to, yeah. to, uh, to be able to use it? And, and, and I think that skills question is very, very relevant. And let me just take two examples to just uh, illustrate it. And these are just amazing examples on inclusion and, and skilling. Uh, the number one, I think, is an example uh, of uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, initiative that was funded uh, by the Gates Foundation uh, for a, something called Echo Financial. And, and Echo Financial used a, a, a bunch of solutions to bring the mid and low income population in India, which was financially excluded uh, into the formal banking system by providing them a cash point where they could oh. convert their cash into a digital form of payment. Uh, now, everything is being paid digitally, but they're the, the excluded ones can't even make that payment because they're not. You know, so they created these customer service points. It's a combination of MSME sort of entrepreneurship and the, the, the technology coming together to make that happen. And the second example uh, I would have is just on the scaling and inclusion. And I'll go back to something that we started called uh, the Project Sangam. Uh, and, and we realized that, uh, that most people 
you say listen i'll provide you skills you are a uh, you're in a blue collar uh, job and i'll provide you new skills to do that job better and the person says hey listen if i devote time to learning skills i'm actually taking away from my earning time uh, and right. i don't have that luxury or flexibility in life i can either eat sleep spend some time on myself or i'm traveling and and i can't i don't have time for training uh, mm-hmm. and and how do you bring that i can't go to school i don't have that luxury so we thought through that and we said in you know the low bandwidth situations while you're in a bus or a train or something going to work and coming back from work you anyway trying to watch a video at that time you observe that the, and everybody in the country might be watching something during that transit can you use that same headphone that you're using to watch the video and that uh, that uh, maybe smartphone maybe a low end device and can you just bring content during that time to get training uh, wow. and 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 therefore you use that time uh, to in, get included and also get it in a format that it can run on low bandwidth it can uh, it can cache on your phone for a little while all of that so i think project sangam was a big big uh, uh, sort of capability we we partnered with the swachh bharat uh, e learning portal uh, and and this was deployed to train 1 lakh municipal functionaries uh, last year and the now the platform is being uh, deployed in many developing countries and and really uh, across asia and africa very similar situations uh, and a couple of million enrollments coming up uh, already so i think i'm just giving you solutions there which define access which define inclusion and which define skilling thank you thank you anand uh, fascinating and and i i i love the the three points which you made but also the work at home and work from home the distinction which you made uh, on that uh, let, let me turn back uh, to you ravi uh, now you've often said uh, and you do uh, um, uh, say some very provocative statements from time to time but you have said that formal jobs are failing and entrepreneurship is more often a compulsion rather than a choice So, given this trend, uh, what fundamental shifts do you think are required to check uh, inequality and to spread prosperity? Yeah. Well, look again. Pre even pre COVID, there was, uh, as you remember, um, significant problem of unemployment. In fact, the unemployment figures had reached the highest in forty three years. and um it's not a political statement it's a simply a fact and it's driven by structural economics for quite some time over a decade the formal economy uh, job creation has been um half of gdp growth and so just the gap keeps rising and now with all the stuff that anand and his fellow colleagues at uh, microsoft are cooking up productivity is only increasing so even more pressure on formal employment right so and then of course covid has come and you know ilo has said 400 million uh, people are going to be pushed back in poverty and all that so if you think about this look where are the jobs and livelihoods going to come from the most promising avenue is entrepreneurship you know but when in india when we think about entrepreneurship we tend to think about the bookends the extremes we either celebrate the you know tech enabled unicorn want to be like ola and oyo largely urban or we celebrate the self employed pakoda wala and the lady who sells vegetables and so forth now now both are important but remember that the self employment is basically disguised unemployment they are necessity entrepreneurs not real entrepreneurs who are pursuing opportunity and at the other end those uh, unicorns do not create huge amounts of um, employment they do enable gig work but not real employment so what we need to see it much like as we've seen in china is millions of um, enterprises that are the most mundane things right the motorcycle repair shop the mobile shop the food stall etc which are able to create 5 to 50 employees over time and if you can get a large enough number of these um, you know uh, coming into existence then you've got real dynamism in the economy and real job creation engine so we've been applying our minds to that so i think this is not not a silver bullet but one of the most important avenues to prosperity and that's why we call this mass entrepreneurship vedika because it's mass in terms of the numbers but also mm. it is pervasive it's not just a large city phenomenon this kind of entrepreneurship can happen must happen in smaller towns and villages and so forth 
Now, what does it take to uh, create this, right? So if you take entrepreneurial cities like uh, centers like our hubs like Bangalore and Gurgaon. The, the, the reason um, they're so successful is you have all the elements of an entrepreneurial ecosystem working that has fallen into place over a decade or two decades and they're yeah. working in tandem. So you have successful entrepreneurs who are role models, they're angel investors, they're mentors, they inspire new people to come in. Then you have education system, you have um, venture capital, you have access to credit, you have infrastructure. So all the pieces fall in place. So what we have to do is if we want to go into a new place, Saharanpur, and say, how do we create and ignite entrepreneurship here? We have to think about what are the interventions that will create this uh, ecosystem over time. And we think of it, and I'd encourage all listeners to think of it as like a, a farming analogy. You need good seed, you need good soil, and you need good climate. And seed is basically the supply of young entrepreneurs with the ambition to create businesses, the mindset and skill set. By the way, it turns out that this is surprisingly easy to create. So my co-founder, Mekin Maheshwari, and his Udyam Foundation have been working with Delhi government for two years. And they've been running this entrepreneurship curriculum in a thousand Delhi schools. And even mm -hmm. though it's just been a year, it's astonishing to see the sea change in these seven and a half lakh kids, nine to 12 standards, and their level of ambition, their self-confidence and how they, you know, they're on their way. So seed is important. Soil is important. What is soil? Soil is basically infrastructure, roads, mm -hmm. physical connectivity, digital connectivity, um, access to energy or electricity. Uh, access to credit, all these things, largely in the domain of government. And then the final most important thing is climate. Climate is two things, Vedika and Anand. It is, on one hand, ease of doing business, which I've already talked about. And the other one is culture. We don't talk much about culture. If you look at culture in a Gurgaon or Bangalore, there's some very distinctive attributes. For instance, there's a, gen there's a sense of equality, relative, in e uh, relative equality. There's a sense that everybody is capable of doing something. Uh, risk taking is encouraged, failure is not frowned upon, right? And you go to a small town in India, in UP or wherever, and you'll find that these cultural attributes are missing. There is a very strong hierarchy based on about who's capable of doing what and so on and so forth. The parents beat, uh, you know, beat risk out of a young person, say, what do you mean you want to start a business? Go get a government job, okay? Apply for the police or the army or the IAS, whatever. So we've got to work on all these aspects and that's what we're trying to do in game in three or four cities. And we're supported fortunately by Rockefeller, Microsoft, all kinds of good people. So our aim is, can we in the next year or so crack the code, the model, and then replicate this across 300 cities over the next decade. So I'm, you know, this is a very narrow view of prosperity, but I think it's an important, um, very, very important client. Thank you, Ravi. And, and I love the farming analogy of uh, seed, soil, and climate. And I, uh, I am going to come back to you, especially on the climate point uh, when I get back to you. Uh, but, and, and it's fascinating to me to see how the answers of the two of you are so linked and just feed off of each other. So uh, maybe it, it's all about coming from the same Microsoft culture. I, I don't know. But right. Anand, uh, you, you talked about this, right? In, in your answer also, it, that no one set of organizations can do this by themselves, right? It's about everybody coming together, playing uh, a role. So now zooming into the role of corporations, right? And uh, large corporations, and especially multinational corporations like yourselves, uh, how do you see, you, companies like you playing a role in both uh, creating the infrastructure and the ecosystem uh, for this economic inclusion. So I, I'll reinforce what you just said. No one organization or even one government can solve the challenge of this scale uh, alone. There, it really requires very strong public and private sectors coming together to do this. I'll go back to this concept of the purpose-driven digital and the solutions that are required to solve the challenges of people and planet. And, and before I speak of the startups and the SMBs criticality mm -hmm. uh, for India's economic recovery and spreading for prosperity, uh, I'm just 
fascinated with the entrepreneurship in India. And I agree with uh, Ravi that I think we tend to celebrate the two ends uh, of, uh, of that, uh, that entrepreneurship. But there are green shoots and, and there are some amazing stories that inspire us to believe that, you know, things are changing around us. We may not be seeing them at scale, but there are good stories there. And, and one of the stories that, that just got me thinking about it is about uh, this company called Interview Mocha. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and this was a very interesting story, not just because of uh, what this is about, but who is this about? Uh, Mm -hmm. This is uh, uh, about a small company that is revolutionizing and its mission is to revolutionize revolutionize both the world of digital skills assessment and also digitize interviews Mm -hmm. so that you can you can get the job process going much faster uh, and Mm -hmm. therefore uh, you can get uh, people in. Uh, they are a born in the cloud company uh, and and they they're right now based in Pune but this is about uh, Amit Mishra's journey. Amit Mishra is the founder uh, mm-hmm. of Interview Mocha. He came from uh, Amravati uh, mm-hmm. and he worked in a small startup and then got to this opportunity uh, of creating uh, and starting Interview Mocha. And it was great resilience and uh, great growth mindset behind this story. Uh, we are basically helping them as a company. We, we support a lot of startups. We, uh, we really work with them extensively. So we are, in, we are enabling the tech capabilities and the go-to-market of Interview Mocha so that they can mm-hmm. get to a lot more companies faster. Uh, we are also helping them build a platform of AI and, and, and tech capabilities so that skill assessment uh, can, can become better. Uh, as they uh, they go along and we've listed their product and capability on a marketplace so that a lot more uh, can access uh, and, and give them scale uh, by giving them uh, the access to the new markets and customers. So that's at the just the startup and SMB level where I, I think companies like ours have that infrastructure platform to just accelerate the journey uh, of mm-hmm. such entrepreneurship. The second is uh, there are, as I mentioned, a lot of need for new skills. And, and digital skills is very, very critical. And not everybody is going to go start their own company. And they're going to work in many such companies and they're also going to work in larger companies, but they may work from different places and at different times. And so we recently announced a global skilling initiative, uh, which is in partnership with LinkedIn, GitHub, uh, and Microsoft coming together to really take an ambition of skilling 25 million people. Uh, on the planet and India will definitely have a, have a good share of that uh, as we drive digital skills. So building on this initiative, we partnered with the National Skills Development Corporation uh, to skill over 1 lakh youth mm, in the next 12 months. Uh, and we're also supporting the government initiative uh, for future skills in partnership with NASCOM. So there is a lot of work that I think uh, industry bodies, companies like ours uh, and government can do uh, in both the, the jobs that are coming up, the digital jobs uh, uh, and the skills that need for even regular jobs and in supporting entrepreneurship in the middle, uh, which I think uh, Ravi was speaking of earlier. Hey, and Anand, you could mention that you're also supporting game. It's oh, totally. So I, I, I should have said that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I, I can see that the, there are a lot of questions for both of you, but uh, let me uh, ask you one quick question to each, and then we'll go to a uh, lot of questions which are coming from the listeners. So well, Ravi, I, uh, I wanted to go back to the climate uh, point which you made, right? And, and I know you wear several hats, and one of them is UNICEF's uh, special representative for the youth. So... Uh, it would be great to hear your views on what are the deepest worries that the youth are uh, facing today and, and how ready do they feel uh, in, in terms of overcoming the challenges uh, that they see ahead of them? Yeah, great question, Vedika. Look, um, when we talk youth in the UN system, we typically talk about uh, talking about young people between the age of 10 and 24. And in India, that number is some, some, somewhere of the order of 360 million, okay? So it's a very large number. It's the largest squad in history and 20% of the global youth. And again, even pre-COVID, they had you know, enormous talent and energy, but faced enormous challenges. One of the challenges is, of course, the education system, which the previous pan- uh, panelist speaker, Dr. Kasturi Rangan, talked about, which is 
look, um, even though enrollment uh, en enrollment is good, half of them drop out by 10th grade, literacy, numeracy outcomes, not where it needs to be. And most of all, the education system in virtually every country, including developed countries, is completely failing to prepare students for a, what's called a VUCA world, a vol volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous world where things are changing so fast. And then COVID hits. So, the, so what are the I issues? The, well, it's education. They, a lot of kids find their education truncated. And it's much worse if you're on the wrong side of the digital divide without access to the internet and you can't take all these online courses and so forth. Number one, number two is, un, uh, is employment, right? So as I said, even before COVID, you had very high levels of unemployment, particularly formal jobs. And that too, the lack of aspirational jobs. One of the statistics that bothers me greatly and astonishes me is a young person with a higher education degree in India is six times as likely to be unemployed as another young person who is illiterate, okay? Yeah. Normally we say, we think higher education is a passport to a better future, but here it's six times as um, uh, likely to be unemployed. What's going on? Well, two things are going on. One is that the jobs that are being created are not aspirational. So somebody with a college degree says, well, I'm not sure that's the kind of thing I want to do, you know, gig work or delivering some package or food or whatever. Number two, they're unemployable. They may have a higher education degree, but it's not worth very much. So these challenges are huge and the employment challenges become even bigger post COVID. And then we're talking about, um, you know, depending on which so, uh, socioeconomic segment you're from, really, mm -hmm. really devastating issues. For instance, so many young children depend on the midday meal as a yeah. major source of nutrition. If schools closed, you know, what happens to that? So many young girls depend on school for access to a clean to toilet and you know, fe you know high feminine hygiene products and so forth, all cut off. The levels of mental health are, are skyrocketing for young people around the world. So all sorts of issues which are, which are getting compounded because of COVID. And this is where I think I'm really glad UNICEF had the foresight to launch this uh, initiative called Generation Unlimited, which in India we call Yuva. And the idea is, look, we need to do a bunch of things to engage young people outside the education system. So in India, we're saying, look, we need to engage 300 million young people as volunteers, change makers, and you know, in their communities, and give them self-confidence more than anything else. How do you stop feeling like a victim and feel that you're in control of your destiny? So we're just launched in Punjab. We're launching in Gujarat, Maharashtra, Karnataka very soon. The second big one is working with good private sector companies like Microsoft. How do you get massive numbers of people, the 21st century skills, which is working in teams, communication, finding information, digital skills, career counseling with things like LinkedIn and so forth. And the final thing is work with private sector to create pathways to different types of productive work. Formal jobs are important, but it's just one category of productive work. There's also entrepreneurship, there's gig work, et cetera. So how our aim is work with private sector to enable 100 million people over the decade to find different types of productive work. So you know all, the challenges are daunting, but as Anand said earlier, if we can get private sector, government, social sector working in mission mode, um, much is possible. And that's what we are uh, optimistic about. Thanks. Thanks, Ravi. And I'm, I'm going to uh, come to you. The organizers are telling me, even though the earlier session ended late, we have to finish on time. So I'm going oh, to ask you a quick question. And then I, I, I would love to take, you know, continue this conversation for at least a couple of hours. But I'm going to ask you a quick question. And then I'm going to come to you, Anand. Uh, so Ravi, uh, a question which came up is that the CEA said in a press meet that not enough number of jobs are being created in MSMEs. Quick views on that? I think that he, he's absolutely right. And that goes back to our report, which says not only are these large majority of our MSMEs stunted, they're also not growing and they're not capable of growth. We looked at the uh, you know 6.3 crore MSMEs. Uh, half of them are not finance ready. Okay, yeah. that means you shouldn't lend to them. Uh, yeah. Okay, you'll end up with an NPA situation. 
uh, and only about si 6 million out of 63 million are actually finance worthy, which coincides well with that 10% that I talked about who are actually eligible for the uh, government stimulus program and so forth. So yeah, unless we do a lot of interventions to break the cycle of failure that they're trapped in, of being informal, therefore unable to access credit and therefore unable to be productive and grow, it's not going to change. So th that's the challenge before us. But again, this is not rocket science, Vedika. We, I think, clearly have diagnosed and understood the contours of the problem. Uh, like most complex problems, any single intervention won't help. You know, yeah. it is like an anti-retroviral vaccine. You need to do three or four things at the same <laughs> time in a given place. And if you can do that, you, can, you will get uh, a very good outcome. And we're working with uh, a guy called Dan Eisenberg out of uh, Harvard Business School and Babson, who's demonstrated this in a number of places. And so we are getting on the ground in Karnataka, Punjab to actually demonstrate in the next 12 months that we can accomplish this. So if we are successful, I think um, th there's a ready-made solution. Thank you. Quick question for you, Anand. Uh, you have the ringside view on where technology is going. What are the themes which are going to come up and uh, or, or coming up? And so from your vantage point, what do you think are the opportunities, uh, both in terms of uh, workforce distribution as well as labor participation, when you look at uh, you know the next five, ten years, or even longer? So, Vedika, let me answer this question not from the lens of technology, uh, but the okay. lens of work, uh, and and that can kind of. Uh, give indications of what the technology can do. I'll go back again to Ravi's point earlier, saying, listen, postgraduates, uh, unemployment. Now, I was talking to Satya Prabhakar, the founder and CEO of uh, Suleka.com uh, mm -hmm. last week. And I was fascinated to hear this story uh, about a tutor uh, in, uh, in a small town in the south of India, uh, where she is a postgraduate in math, uh, and she used to teach young children uh, math. And as soon as the lockdowns happened, that avenue of, uh, of work got this completely disrupted. Now, Suleka.com provides the opportunity for uh, independent small businesses to connect with users. And therefore, they launched this e-learn initiative during the lockdown, where tutors could log on uh, and, and mm -hmm. create their own profiles and teach children uh, on, uh, through the platform. Now, Think about this, that suddenly this woman was, and this teacher was constrained before the lockdown to only teach children in a, in a limited geographic radius. And now suddenly she has the opportunity to focus on teaching maybe seventh and eighth grade students math across the country in specific areas. And yeah. suddenly, to me, that is the gig economy. Uh, and the gig yeah. economy, we talk about it in the context of maybe just delivery people or, uh, or other kinds of work. Uh, but yeah. gig economy is for everyone. And you, yeah. can, you can actually specialize. Then you can say, I need that postgraduate degree in a specific area because my, my market is not just my city or my locality, not my state, even not my country. Uh, and we can go beyond that. So to me, just the nature of work that will change going forward, I think it's really in the gig economy that will get driven by changed habits and changed experiences uh, that we've had uh, during the last five months and in the upcoming few months. And that to me is the most fundamental change. And technology is just an enabler to make this happen. Thank you, Anand. So it, it's been a real pleasure to speak with both of you, uh, Ravi and Anand. And, and I also seen some complaints on the chat box saying they wish we had enough time to answer all the questions which were coming your way, but I'm sure the organizers will send them your way. I think, uh, you know, I, I take back a lot of optimism uh, from this conversation. Yes, the problems are significant. Yes, our uh, economic growth so far has been unbalanced and we've relied a lot on the larger cities, but there is, uh, they are real opportunities to correct that imbalance. There's, good stuff being done already, whether it's in terms of government schemes, whether it's in terms of private sector and the government coming together, private sector and the civic society coming together. Uh, and, and there are some specific ideas on how uh, we, can, we can take this forward. And so a few words I would like to leave everybody with, partnerships, 
be persistent. Nobody can do this alone. Uh, the need to involve the youth as the change makers, purpose-driven digital, access, inclusion, and skilling. I love that. And uh, Ravi, the anti-retroviral solution. I love that too. So thank you. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Ravi. And of course, entrepreneurship. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to speak with both of you. And uh, thank you to the Nudge. Thanks a lot, Vedika. And thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Vedika. Thank you, Ravi. And thank you, Arun. Uh, sincere thanks for your time, taking your time out and joining us at the, at the Nudge Global Edition. Thank you.